have $50,000 for the Arts Commission. Thank you very much. That is a wonderful help. It'll help our resident artists. And I know I've talked to you about it before, but the resident artists need that help. I also wanted to thank you for the 15,000 that you um, gave us for ARPA funds that is going towards our arts explosion. It's coming up June 2nd. Please be there. I've asked the mayor to give prizes to all of the art that will be there. It's a juried contest at the PAEC. We have 136 pieces of artwork coming that we will show for the entire Recording weekend. in progress. Am I not recorded? That's good. <laughs> Just keep going. Okay. We have 136 pieces coming to the PAEC for the entire weekend. It's going to be a wonderful arts festival. On Saturday, food trucks, um, kids' artwork. We'll have musical interludes. It's going to be a big time. Uh, what I wanted to talk to you, too, about is the other needs for the Arts Commission. Um, what I'd like to see is the contracts for services doubled, tripled. An example is that last, well, 2022, we were able to give to the Fedway Symphony $8,500 in a contracts for services. Auburn was able to give the Auburn Symphony 65000 How can they compete? They, they are actually very fine symphonies. One cannot live when it's one-seventh of the other. We need to increase the contracts for services. We're, we're servicing eight, nine groups now. We cannot do it without more money. We have special programs that we really want to put into place. None of those can be put into place this year because we don't have funds. One of them, of course, is covering the electrical boxes. Another one is to, you know, we need to have our at-risk youth put to use. We need to paint the pillars of our uh, sound transit. We need to take them, instead of being a graffiti artist, which everybody hates, we need to employ them for our graphics uh, murals. Lots of cities do this, um, including Tacoma, Everett. Um, Kent now has a program for hiring at-risk youth to graffiti and make it art pre-approved. Uh, we can have traffic devices that can save traffic accidents and collisions, paint the streets. We need to paint the crosswalks. If anybody's traveled up to Capitol Hill, their crosswalks are the rainbow colors. We need to do that here. And of course, the arts explosion needs to be funded next year. All of that equals about $150,000 more. I hate to say this, but I've been in talks with Mr. Um, Bill Vidino about needing this 150 extra since October of last year. I've been in talks with John Hutton, and in front of me, most of the Arts Commission, the president of the Symphony, the president of the Fedway Chorale, uh, representatives from the foundation, the Performing Arts Foundation. He has promised us the 50, which you're giving today, thank you, and another 150 for the Arts Commission. I realize you probably have no idea about doing this. And I, I don't know if it's a Harry Winston moment that he gave this to me to make me go away, but it's there. And we need more. We, I don't have to remind you, and it's embarrassing to say, but we are rock bottom among any city around us for funding for arts and public art. I looked up Des Moines today, half the population, about the same revenue per capita, they control 125,000. They are an arts district. We need to do more. Twice as population, we should be up the 250 mark. Yet, we are back to 1990s pricing. That has never changed. We're at 50,000 and have always been at 50,000. We need to start changing that. I thank you for the 50. I thank you for before for the ARPA. And I hope there's, there's change in the future. Thanks. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that would like to address the council in public comment? Is there anybody on the internet? Okay. Seeing that there's more, no more, we'll move on to committee business. Is there any committee business that you'd like to bring up, Erica or Linda or Susan? No? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move to item A, which is approval of summary of minutes, March 28th, 2023. We have a motion. 
I move to approve the minutes as written for the May 2nd. Mark. Oh, yeah, May 2nd, Mike. Yep. May meeting. 2nd. Sorry, I, I apologize. So the consent agenda for May 2nd, 2023. Okay, I'll second that. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you, Erica. Now we'll move to uh, Mr. Walsh, uh, surplus of CD vehicle 83260. Good evening, uh, members of council. So uh, tonight I'm here, this is a little bit of a formality item. Um, but to Before the city can dispose of a vehicle, since it's a, a licensed thing, uh, we have to have council authority to dispose of it. So that's why we're here at a, at a high level. Um, so as a little bit of background, uh, this is related to one of the community development pickup trucks. The In March of this year, basically the engine failed. Um, we did price what it would cost to repair the engine as well as the actual, what ended up being the cheaper option would be a full replacement of the engine. Um, ultimately, in looking at the cost benefit of doing that and the value of a 2007 vehicle, it's not fiscally responsible to do either. So at this point, the recommendation is to dispose of it. In talking with the community development staff, they are comfortable with the vehicles that they have and this not impacting a level of service. So there is a new vehicle that um, we are in the middle of, we have the vehicle, we're in the middle of outfitting it currently. It's actually out at one of our third party vendors having uh, emergency lighting put on it currently that will be ready by, in theory, the beginning of June. Um, so there's a little bit of a, uh, a grace period while they're, they're making it work for the next kind of month. But with that in mind, there's you know, light at the end of the tunnel. So to authorize or to surplus a vehicle, um, according to state policy, we have to have authority to dispose of it. So that is why we are here tonight. Anyone have any questions? Okay, do we have a motion? I motion to move forward option one to the May 2nd, 2023 city council consent agenda for approval. I'll second that, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We'll now move to item C, ordinance uh, amendment to the city comprehensive plan and parks, recreation, and open space plan. Uh, good evening, uh, Committee Chair Dovey, Council Member Norton, uh, Deputy Mayor Honda, Council President Kochmar, and uh, any other council members who may, may be on Zoom. Uh, before you is a proposed amendment to the Federal Way Comprehensive Plan Capital Facilities Chapter, which is Chapter 6 of our currently adopted Comprehensive Plan, uh, as well as to the Parks, Rec, and Open Space Plan, or the PROS Plan, which is incorporated by reference within the Capital Facilities Chapter of the comprehensive plan. The policy question is whether city council should approve amendments to the federal way comprehensive plan, capital facilities chapter, and to the pros plan to facilitate establishment of a park impact fee. The objective is uh, really threefold to update the parks capital improvement plan since uh, most, uh, uh, the most recent parks capital improvement plan update was as associated with the 2019 uh, pros plan update. Uh, and also within that updated CIP list to identify which projects specifically are eligible to be included in the, the park impact fee calculation. Uh, and then that, that, that's a distinction that right now in the capital improvement plan is, is lacking. So that's just an added uh, uh, level of detail. And then lastly, to bring the capital facilities chapter up to date in other ways, 
Uh, for instance, updating a statement in the pros plan to reflect the existence of a park impact fee, which would be true by the time of adoption if it uh, goes to adoption, and then uh, correcting a few outdated references in the parks section of the capital facilities chapter uh, that became out of date after the pros plan was most recently updated in 2019. The amendments before you uh, contain the capital projects list update the identification of which projects are eligible for the park impact fee calculation, and then other text up updates to reflect the existence of the park impact fee and to bring the parks section of the capital facilities chapter up to date. So tonight's council recommendation is only on the comprehensive plan amendments uh, that would facilitate the adoption of a park impact fee. There will be a separate um, uh, ordinance brought to council it's actually going to LUTC next week um, that is the code amendment that uh, speaks to the process um, th that speaks to the specific requirements and uh, process requirements uh, etc regarding the park impact fee um, and then there will be a separate action from that for uh, adopting the actual fee schedule and setting the amount of the park impact fee so um, uh, that's just context to the the more narrow focus of tonight's action as a procedural note, council may be familiar with um, seeing comprehensive plan amendments come through annually as part of the annual docketing process, um, which you already saw around come through earlier this year. Um, under state law and under federal way revised code, which is consistent with state law, uh, capital Im amendments to the capital facilities chapter specifically, and when done so concurrent with a budget amendment, can be done more, more frequently than once per year. And so that's why you're seeing this comprehensive plan amendment out of the normal sequence that you normally see them. Uh, so a SEPA DNS was issued on this comp plan amendment on March 31st. Uh, there was one comment. I'll speak to that in a moment. Um, tonight's recommendation would be to forward this to the May 16th council meeting, and that would be a joint first reading and public hearing. Uh, and then uh, it, that would put it on track for uh, possible adoption at the June 6th meeting. So there was one comment from Tacoma Water uh, within the SEPA comment period. Uh, the comment was fairly boilerplate, it appeared, and spoke largely to, to things that one would only be apl applicable if there was a future park-specific project uh, that happened to be within the, the service area of Tacoma Water, and it, they would be relevant to a park uh, a specific project proposal at some point in the future, but that's included in your packet. So um, uh, we have John Giller Gucci here from the FCS group, which is a consultant that has been working on the rate study. Uh, you'll see the detailed rate study, or the council will see the detailed rate study in next week's LUTC packet. Um, and uh, John will just put into context the updates to the capital improvement list in relation to the park impact fee calculation. I will note just one uh, difference between what's in your packet and what you'll see on the slides uh, is the park impact fee or PIF eligibility percentage. Um, there's a slight difference and that's because that rate study is still draft. It'll be final by the time council um, saw the ordinance uh, for the for both the comp plan amendment and for the code amendment at the May 16th meeting. So th those two percentages will line up by the time council um, sees both of these different ordinances. So with that, uh, John will speak more. Uh, thank you, Evan, and thank, thank you, committee members and, and council members. I will uh, start with a little bit of, of broad background on impact fees and then sort of summarize the calculation just for the purpose of placing, as Evan said, in context the lists and the importance of the lists. So when, when we talk about an impact fee, we're talking about the one-time fees uh, paid at the time of development or permitting um, by new development. Um, these have to be charged for projects and project costs that are related to serving growth, relating to serve, serving new development. They can't exceed a proportionate share of the cost of the facility, so growth can't be paying for more than growth's share in these impact fees. Um, these requirements are straight out of the RCW. We follow them very carefully. Some of the other highlights are summarized here. We have to demonstrate a balance between other funding sources and impact fees. We can't rely solely on impact fees to fund these 
projects and we're um, even the initial results don't don't do that so we do show that balance in the case of a developer who builds a project or provides a project from that list as a condition of development you have to give them credit against their impact fee for that for that project it only makes sense they're providing a project instead of paying the impact fee um, and, and here's the one of the real important points as it pertains to tonight in the bottom section there we can only spend money in conformance with the capital facilities plan element of the comprehensive plan so you have to have a list an adopted list of projects in that capital facilities plan element in order to spend impact fee money on those projects and in order to calculate a valid impact fee there is a 10-year limit on spending the money that is to say once the impact fees are collected the city has 10 years to spend them that has not generally proven to be an issue in impact fees around the state we do see them um, spent uh, on projects as needed usually well in advance of the 10-year limit so the the math is pretty straightforward our focus is on that future facilities component so um, an impact fee can have two pieces to it. The big one is that one in the middle. If you picture a list of capital projects and the growth related portion or impact fee eligible portion of each of those projects, the sum of those growth related project costs divided by the growth that it will serve gives us that future facilities component. And I say, as I say, I'll, I'll fly over that math in just a minute. There's also um, the ability to collect a small existing facilities component. If it can be shown that there's some capacity in the park system right now that's available to serve growth, then we have the basis for a, a buy-in to that existing capacity. And there is a small one uh, that we'll show you tonight. The sum of the two components is the impact fee. So starting with the denominator in that calculation, which is growth, we forecast population using PSRC estimates. Um, first, we bring the 2019 actual numbers up to 2023 estimates and then forecast them to the end of our planning period in 2044. We also use PSRC estimates to forecast employees because we're going to um, we're going to have a non-residential component to this resulting impact fee. We know that people who work in Federal Way don't have the same access to the parks as full-time residents. So that third row there, residential equivalent employees, that's the number of employees converted to population or residential equivalents. Our denominator is that lower right-hand number, 22,774. So you'll see that one again in a minute. We use the inventory of current parks, and you see that number in the middle of the top table there, Parker Natural Area, 1,031.15 acres. That's an important number because by the end of execution of the project list in that planning period, if you look at that lower table, you'll see that uh, the minimum quantity is 918 acres. That's if we were to look at the, I'm going to, I'm going to summarize this for you. Um, because our level of service is technically going down over the planning period and we'll have fewer acres per thousand in population at the end of the period, that means 100% of our parks list that adds acreage is includable in the impact fee. So you'll see that in what we're calling the expansion list. So these are those projects which add acreage to the city's inventory of developed parks. Two of them, the downtown park expansion and the South Light Rail Station Park totaling about 16 and a half million. Because of that analysis you saw on the previous page, 100% of those park 
parks as envisioned are eligible for inclusion in the impact fee. The remaining list we're calling the infill list and that that's our language that's not a, an, a technical term. These are all the projects that are improving existing parks so they could be adding amenities to existing parks um, adding improvements to existing parks they're not necessarily adding capacity for future users so you'll see some of that PIF eligibility column you see 18 a little over 18 percent that's the percentage that's going to change a little bit with the the or that's a little bit different than the one that's in the report all that is is a proportional allocation of those projects between existing population and residential equivalents and future forecasted population and equivalents. So we're basically saying those projects that are a little over 18% are proportionally serving existing customers and growth. You'll also see a number of projects with 0%. Those are straight replacement they're not adding anything that will benefit future users so we can't include them in the impact fee so it's a pretty long list here this is the first part second part third and final part so the total cost of that infill list about 44.3 million of that about 6.3 million is PIF eligible and again draft numbers, the numbers are still going to change a little bit, but hopefully conceptually you understand what, what we're doing there. Um, could, could you go back to the middle, the, you just, thank you, yeah, you, you went so fast I couldn't get, read the project. Oh, sorry. That's okay. So, so yeah, can I ask a question the now or do I have to go, wait? Go right ahead, Linda. Um, I'm wondering why for the years that you have, is it the years to be completed? I'm wondering how you choose the years that the project will be done. And, and I'll, I'll take that question. And so uh, we can only put projects on the list that are adopted by City Council at this point. And so we had kind of two lists to go off of. Um, we have our pros plan adopted list of projects. And so all of those projects are included there. And then I've been working with the finance department. We've kind of got this, this 10 year outlook or capital uh, projects that need to need to be done and so that was the second list that is encompassed of that um, there is a, a desire and we know that there are more parks and projects and ideas out there um, but uh, we couldn't include those in the list because they're not adopted and we are in the parks department we are poised to start a pros plan update and so through the through the remainder of this year uh, we're going to get a lot of community input and more projects additions um, which will give us the ability to update this list in the future, uh, but based on timing and uh, the urgency that uh, these park impact fees were wanting to be adopted, uh, we had to kind of rest with what we had for now and we can relook and add to that list at a future date. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Honda, do you have Thank a question? You. Yeah, well, I, um, one day I would like to see on this list uh, an inclusive park, a park for children and people of all abilities and pickleball courts. I know that it's not on the list now, but I just want to bring it up again. Yeah, and uh, we had a little conversation about that uh, earlier, earlier Councilwoman Honda, but um, absolutely, and, and that's what kind of that pros, like I say, we're trying to strike right now while the iron is hot and, and get the fees implemented. We know there's a lot of unidentified projects that are not adopted or in, in any plan by the city, uh, but that's what that pros plan process is for the remainder of the year, and then we would look to, to re-engage with the FCS group to, to recalculate what our, our maximum uh, potential would be thank you which I, I have one question based on what uh, deputy mayor Honda just asked so we adopt this list and pickleball courts we decide we, next year that that's what we want to do we can readjust it and put it on the list and we can spend the money on that if that's a high priority yeah. if once, it, it once it makes the list yes. and and you're not obligated as a city legally to construct or execute the plan in this order in these years you have the ability you have flexibility to and and the, and the fund can only fund 18 percent of the project so 
if you're saying we allocate eight, we can do 18 percent if we were to replace something. I'm just looking at outdoor areas and 119,000. We could only use 11,492 out of the fund towards that project. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Thank you. So this was the third section of the list. Did you want me to give you a minute on that? Okay. Okay. So you'll see here in this summary of the future facilities cost basis, that 16 and a half million, which was from the expansion list, the 6.3 million, which was the impact fee eligible portion of the infill project list. So together 22.8 million in future costs by the uh, an analytical approach that we've taken there is and the fact that the level of service technically will be a little bit lower in 2044 in acres per thousand than it is now that means there's a slight surplus of parks system capacity right now that gives us an impact fee eligible amount of a little over a million dollars in existing parks so um, again, a small existing facilities uh, component there. Together, we, we add them up, we divide by... It's a new uh, fee they're adding on. I apologize. So uh, um, that 23 point eight six million divided by the projected growth in residential equivalents gives us a park impact fee per residential equivalent of you see about about a thousand forty eight again these numbers are not final um, but the way that the that that unit cost is applied is by the average number of occupants by dwelling unit type so you see the schedule at the bottom of this table a single family dwelling unit in federal way the average occupancy is 2.94, so that gives us the resulting fee for a new single family residence by this approach. Likewise, uh, differing occupancies for different types of dwelling units result in different park impact fees. And then uh, we're assuming an average of one occupant for an accessory dwelling unit, um, which is a, a policy choice whether or not to charge them, but that that result you see there, a little over $1,000. And then the per employee rate is applied by the type of business based on industry data telling us on average the number of employees per square foot by type of business. So you have a schedule, uh, you see in the far right column, the park impact fee per thousand square feet for these different types of new businesses. I have, I have a Mayor Honda, you can go first. I have a question. Currently, when someone builds something new in federal way, they have to have green space, or um, that's correct, right? And if they choose not to do that, or a percentage of that could go to a park, is that correct? That sounds like a fee in lieu. Yeah. Cur yeah. Cur Currently, uh, if they opted to not build that, that recreational property or that open space, yeah, they can pay a fee in lieu, they petition the city, and then it goes to, for director approval whether or not we accept that or not. But that would, that would, still, um, that would still stay even if we have a park impact fee? No, we are actually looking to, to reduce that. There's going to be a future code amendment okay. by community development to reduce that. Um, we did get a little bit of feedback from master builders, and, and so we're, um, you know, uh, Mr. Niven is, is working okay. on, on speaking with them, but no, we are planning to reduce that based on implementing the park impact fee. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we weren't double dipping there. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Could you go back one slide? So, I mean, I'll ask my questions now. We don't have to do the employee fee, that's just something that's Put up there as an example of what could be done correct i mean that is I, absolutely a policy as, a as policy a policy choice. question it's, it, it would change the math such right. uh, so that the other fees should go go up we, these are right okay and if we wanted to change the math that all four of those above were the same we could do that also could we not 
Yes, so you used a single impact fee per dwelling right. unit no matter what type. So, so yes. and if we wanted to make one higher than, you know, three at one and one of them higher, we can do that also? I, I, I don't believe you have that flexibility to, to make changes among okay. the classes without but, data. So if we took the, all, what you basically did, you have five classes, you took the fees and you kind of came up with what it would be based on the numbers of residents potentially. And if, if we wanted to say, we get rid of employees and we have these four and we take the number and just make it straight across, everybody's the same, we could do that. You could do that, yes. Okay. To me, that seems like a fairer way to do it than have varying based on the, the size of the house or the dwelling or the family. But that's for another discussion. Uh, just to close things out, so we have criteria for amending the comprehensive plan in our code. Uh, the staff report speaks to how uh, the criteria is met for all three, that it bears a substantial relationship to public health, safety, and welfare, that it is in the best interest of the residents of the city, and that uh, this amendment is consistent with our RCW 3670A and with the portion of the city's uh, adopted um, uh, the city, the portion of the city's adopted plan that's not affected by the amendment. Um, the staff report speaks to all three of those criteria. So you can uh, recommend uh, adoption as before you uh, uh, amend uh, the proposal um, or uh, recommend that it not be adopted. So with that, are there any questions for? I, I do have staff? one question. As we, if we move this forward, we're not saying that those are the prices. Correct. Like, okay. like I think that's speaking that, to the, the max amount. That's, so. a, that's the example, and we uh, in land use or wherever it is can say, no, these numbers, although the expert says this is how it should be, we can modify those on policy. I, yeah, that's see, putting like that's our the max, rating. so you can go less than that. Yeah, we have X amount of dollars, which is our max, and we have different types of classes of homes, and we can can't raise it any higher than the max, but we can adjust what each building would pay within those that's within a those different categories yeah within the that category that's a policy decision yep okay thank you uh deputy mayor honda if this is adopted by the city council when would it take effect um if it was adopted on the sixth it would either be five or 30 days after the sixth um i so probably by june 11th but possibly as late as uh July 6th that might be more of a, a legal question whether this would be subject to the 30 or the five day So anything currently that is in the process of already permitted wouldn't be this would not impact them um, Yeah, if they applied for their building permit um, Prior to this being adopted then they would be vested I think under the the current code Which wouldn't does not have a park impact fee. Thank you. And I, I got to assume there's not a whole bunch of people running to get a permit today I mean it's not going to change much between June 30th or July 1st I wouldn't think is that correct I don't know that we've seen a big I think we yeah. there's typically usually an increase in the springtime into the getting yeah. into the warm dry season but um yeah yeah okay okay um uh, yes uh, thank you um, President Lady Culture. over here. <laughs> You're over there. Linda, I, I hate all this formality of Whatever titles works. and things. Go ahead. Hey, you. Um, so I was looking at the numbers, 3,085 for a single-family residential unit, 2,524 for apartment complex, and, yeah, there we are, 2,876 manufactured home. Well, obviously, you're going to get a lot more money from the multifamily dwelling because we have more multifamilies being built than single-family, correct? Do we have an average of what's being built per year? Or? Um, I think we can we can generate reports from our permit si uh, system to show what what type of permits we're getting over time. Mm -hmm. So, um, if for me, it looks like the single family dwelling unit is bearing a higher burden of the cost, even though it looks like there's more people in the dwelling unit. It's just that there are fewer fewer people uh, that are being those single family residential units being built. So I get it would be interesting for me to know how many single family residential 
apartment dwelling units and manufacturing home dwelling units are being built. Accessory dwelling units, we're, we don't have a lot of those. Well, well we could, but we will. Yeah. I mean, Potentially, yeah. Yeah, and considering the new legislation, yeah. And as, uh, so maybe if I could jump on there, Linda, just a mm -hmm. little bit. When we go to land use, I'm assuming we're gonna have the discussion about those four categories, what the numbers look yeah, like. That's what I want. And yeah. so we're not, okay. these are suggested numbers. I think we need to move them around a little bit. Yep, this amendment is just yeah, this to is what just can so calculate can, into yeah. that maximum number for all these different yeah. categories. I don't think we wanna be known as a city that taxes businesses that bring their employees Although some people argue that's a good thing, but um, anyway. Can I make one comment, Chair Doby? Yes. And so uh, based on, the, you know, this is gonna be a staff's recommendation, those numbers may change right. a little bit. But I get what that. we were trying to go for was kind of the equity piece so that based on individuals or singular, you know, people or family, we're all kind of paying the same amount. And so that's why it's, you're seeing a higher rate on a single family dwelling because it's 2.94, Right. that but it's individually per kind of person right. or, or resident on that development but, is the same and so you know yeah. it should that should be kind of yeah. the equality model yeah. it? and if you, if, you, if you took that if you took that approach you would say apartments that have three bedrooms or more will be higher than ones that are two bedrooms or more because you'll have more people if you wanted to be really equity you'd say a two-bedroom house is this and a four-bedroom is that and a three-bedroom apartment is this and I don't think we want to get that far into the dirt but we might we'll probably adjust those a little bit yeah and well, that's something that like yeah. I say we we just chose not to use that methodology to, to, yeah. to come up and, with our figures although and you that, should and you shouldn't that's what we were here for <laughs> but perfect. you're here to give us good recommendations so appreciate that may I ask a question please you got the floor there Erica Thank you. So I just, I'm trying to understand uh, the fee schedule. Um, so it says residents per dwelling unit. Is that you're estimating there are 2.94 residents per dwelling unit? The, those are, or is that the fee you're charging? The 2.94 is an actual average for the city of Federal Way. That is, okay. that is a, the average and number then, of occupants. And then you're charging three thousand eighty five it's a flat fee for that single family dwelling unit and then the twenty five twenty four is that per unit yes. like in an apartment complex of 50, 50 units it would be twenty five twenty four per unit that's right and it's okay. all based on those averages and i got it okay i just wanted to make sure i understood thank you great so erica do you have a motion Yes, I move to forward the proposed ordinance to the June 6, 2023 council meeting for second reading and enactment. And I second that. Any other questions? All in favor? Actually, Aye. Aye. I think that was the, did she say June 6th? Yes, yeah, May 16th. May 16th. Yeah. First, I'm sorry, I'll reading. do it again. Sorry. Well, it says June 6th That's the on here. Motion. I'm sorry. Do we need to make another oh, motion? Oh, she's right, though. The motion has the wrong. Date. You were right, Erica. So it's May 16th, then, or is it June 6th? May 16th for first reading and public hearing. Okay. June, June 6th would be the This date says second reading. So we're going to do the first reading, it's, then. So, uh, Councilmember Nord, if you go up to oh, the Oh, that says committee. council. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You guys, I'm on the wrong page. There you go. I apologize. It said page 9. So I apologize. OK, well, let's I thought, do I, was on the, sure. I thought I was on the correct page okay i move to forward the proposed ordinance to a public hearing and first reading on may 16th 2023 okay i'll second that all in favor aye. aye okay now we'll go to ap vouchers payroll um 51 pages of fun I promise I won't read through all of them. It, don't, it please is, don't, it please don't read through all of the them. Vouchers. You just good, good do evening. I have a motion, Erica? No. <laughs> good evening, Councilmember Doby. You learn Council so much Member. when you go through the vouchers. Yeah, I yeah. know you do. <laughs> Councilmember Norton, Deputy Mayor Honda, um, Council President Coach Smart, in public before you are the AP vouchers and the total amount of $4,153,089.23. Payroll vouchers in the amount of four million three hundred and eight thousand seven hundred and eighty dollars and sixty-five cents. 
Um, I know we sent an email um, based on some of the questions that Deputy Mayor Honda sent previously, and we'd be happy to answer any others that you have. Thank you for Deputy your Mayor answers. Honda. I appreciate them. Okay. Erica, any questions? No. Okay. Do you have a motion? Yes. I move to forward the vouchers to the May 2nd, 2023 consent agenda for approval. I second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, now we'll go to item E, ordinance 2023-2024 budget amendment. Mr. Grub. Thank you. At the time of budget, I made promises to every department and to council and to our citizens that there was more, there were more needs, more budget requests than there, than there was money to go around. So. We would, we would watch our revenue as it came in, and we would watch our expenses be spent. And um, when first quarter came along, we would look and see if we had op any opportunity to green light some of those requests, and it is now that time. In addition to that, <coughs> every year we always do a carryover from the prior year. Uh, the and the criteria is simple, to carry over budget from the prior year, it has to have been budgeted last year. It has to have been revenue that we planned to get last year, we got it, and we obligated it during the year, and then that way, carrying it over into 2023, it simply prevents us from, when we write checks this year, from impacting the current year budget. Pretty straightforward. And in your packet, you'll see a list that looks, uh, that's exactly this. These are awfully big numbers, but every one of them is understandable. Understandable. It goes across many funds. The first one's a perfectly good example. Uh, we received an ARPA grant of 19.2 million, and we still have some of it left to spend, so we want to carry that forward. And the same is true for all of these. A lot of these are capital project spending, and I think budget carryover is pretty simple. We uh, we we pulled every single department. We had them look at their POs. We had them look at their obligations so that we made sure that we were carrying over. We can't bring forward things that they would like to have. It's, you know, you can't just want to bring it forward. We have to have obligated the city. So uh, when it comes to amending the 2023 budget, this is a different case. This is where we are looking to see if we have received revenue this early in the year that's more than we budgeted. And we're also looking to see if we have any expense savings. And I'll tell you, it's too early in the year for me to be able to forecast expense savings. However, revenue, uh, and I hope that this is a lot more transparent than the way that we've brought these amendments in the, in the past. You've, this, this chart is in your packet. The very top line shows that in the first three months of the current year, our investment revenue was budgeted for 450000 And because rates have risen and because we have locked every one of our investments in for multiple years, uh, we know that we have got a current first quarter variance cash in the bank of $330,000. And this one is likely to continue the remainder of the year. And I've done that analysis for all of these different major revenue sources, permits and fees and uh, uh, utility taxes, there was just higher volume than we budgeted. So in the first quarter, uh, we did have a positive revenue variance. We don't know that for sure those two are going to, those bottom four are going to continue the rest of the year. However, as of the first quarter, and some of these, since we get them on a lag, I only have revenue as of February. Still, we've got $1.3 million in revenue. And I we don't want to spend it all. We want to leave us leave ourselves some wiggle room because we know that contingencies happen and things come up unforeseen. So we are looking at making available. We are proposing uh, green lighting 1.167 million. Okay, well that's easy until you get to a managed needs list where I promised everybody I would not lose the list. I would capture all of our budget requests. I wouldn't lose or forget them. We have revisited every single department and they're in touch with uh, what's going on on the ground and they talk to people that have updated, you know, the condition of payment, payment and all the, that sort of thing. So essentially we're updating our budget needs list continually. Now that allows us to prioritize. How do we prioritize? I don't want to be the opinion that everybody tries to sway. I want to put into something that's fairly objective. 
So we took all of our uh, budget needs, we had a list of 105 things, and we said, okay, uh, tell us, uh, are these urgent or are they important? Or are they must-dos or are they good-to-dos? Are they necessities or luxuries? Are they things we should have done already? Uh, are, are they prior obligations, existing obligations? Because we certainly would like to avoid taking on new obligations if we can't keep up with the ones we already have. So we end up with a list, and this is just a section of the list. Uh, this section of the list is going to be what is still not funded. But you can see we've, uh, uh, Brian Davis, the mayor and I, and Chase and I, we met with every single department, and we wanted to understand these projects. Uh, are they, and, and going over the same exact criteria I just mentioned, are they must do? Are they past due? Are they existing obligations? And also, is there any possibility we might have some other funding? Down there at the bottom of the list, you can see that direct emphasis patrols, uh, that, that was uh, 537,000 that the police department asked for. They continue to have sufficient vacancies that they can do that work pay within their existing budget. So we're still monitoring that. Uh, some of these items, uh, let's see, this is, the middle of the list. We can, to some degree, I can, I, I can be conversational with these because we've been through hours of meetings. Uh, at the, at the uh, community center, it says locker room repairs. This is $3 million worth of tile and just maintenance and repair. If you've been to the community center, you've seen that there's a lot of uh, structural uh, repairs and maintenance that, that, that they need to be doing. We need to split this into projects and phases because we can't just green light $3 million, but if, if, if they can get some, some details and some phasing and some projects, we will be able to come back and look at that. Uh, Public Works tells us that there's $3 million worth of pavement that needs to uh, bring the physical condi condition index ca caught up. Uh, we know that we have $1.5 million for a steel dock replacement that's on the list. The maintenance shop in, of the future, we know we're going to need a million dollars a year for debt service. So I added that as a placeholder. We don't need it now. We haven't issued any debt. But we know that we're going to need to get our budget so that we can absorb a million dollars a year. So that's in our future. We also know that we have got a, uh, somewhere between 750000 to a million in fleet replacement costs just to catch up on vehicles that have gone beyond past useful life. So for replacement, that's $500,000. So, so, so can I ask a question? Sure. We just surplused a car that the engine might cost 10000 Right. And a new vehicle's fifty. Why wouldn't we just spend the 10000 and fix the car? Did I miss something? It's all a matter of priorities. Uh, well, but it's, the priority, you're talking about priorities. Yeah, yeah. And a new car's 80, and I don't know, maybe the engine was 20. I'm just curious. So to replace the truck in kind was $49,000. Um, it was roughly fourteen grand to replace the engine. Um, it also needs a new transmission, new driveline, shocks, the body shot. It needs I got to ask the a question as we're going through a stuff. list. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, fleet replacement, we want to be just as methodical and just as structured as, you know, taking care of replacing vehicles. We're going to need to do, replace them perpetually. So I'm not going to go through the whole list. The last item I was going to mention was the server room replacement. Uh, this is the air conditioning for the servers that run the whole city. That gets us to, uh, I mentioned some big numbers. That one right there is 200,000, and all of these are in declining uh, order. These, however, are the top 21. These are the ones when... Uh, our city administrator and mayor and the department heads got together. We said, how can we do the most good? And you can see that the total is a million one sixty-seven, and that's exactly the revenue. And I'm not going to go through this list. This is going to come to city council on first hearing. But look at the list of departments. Uh, I, again, we can be conversational. We can answer questions. I can probably field questions on most of these. However, they're better spoken to by the uh, actual departments who know the specifics. But this is, but this is our uh, prioritizing, this is our, this is our uh, process. I wanted to make it really um, transparent and uh, show you how we went about uh, 
identifying which things are important, which are urgent, which are uh, obligations. Uh, the 11th one down is a Korea-Japan sister city trip. I think we should uh, probably uh, fund that one there in Korea right now. But, uh, <laughs> but, but my I thought we being, already funded it. <laughs> my, my point being, I think the city is obligated, right? And that's the case for a lot of these things. However, it's also the case for a lot of the things that are on the waiting list. So um, this is the process that we're trying to use so that we prioritize, we get as much input as we can across all departments. And I think every department's uh, represented there, even municipal court. Um, I will tell you that of the 105 things, you know, the priority system, I, I'm not going to say it failed me, but 71 of them were must-dos, and 53 of them were past-due, and 52 were uh, existing obligations. Uh, and there were 56 there where there's just no other funding possibility. So what we're looking at is we are looking at green lighting uh, the 1.1 million here in the first quarter. That leaves a list of 15.6 million must-dos, three millions worth of other needs, uh, for a total waiting list of almost 20 million. And so I want to provide some sort of assurance that we are trying very diligently to, 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 to do a really comprehensive assessment, try to prioritize and bring them. So uh, that's uh, my attempt at explaining what's already in your packet. Uh, we're recommending uh, the 22 carryover and the 23 amendment and then we will continue to monitor revenue we'll watch for expense savings and I will continue to maintain the budget needs list that's my promise to every department and I'm open for questions this will come for first and second uh, hearing Deputy Mayor Honda you can go first thank you so on the um, the new truck can you put your list back up Please, I have my list too, but it's that one there. Yeah, the the Ford F two fifty. I I know that we generally well, we always buy new vehicles and we expect them to last for years and years. Is it possible that we could buy used vehicles going forward if they're in good condition and save some money? Uh, without without uh, phoning a friend to ask Parks or the fleet manager, I can tell you that, that this particular truck was because we hired two Parks maintenance workers, but we didn't pr purchase trucks for them. That would be like hiring an accountant, not giving them a computer. As to which vehicle is appropriate, I would leave that to the department. This is just to give them the funding. So um, that's a judgment decision. We do try to get the most useful life that we can so that's an art and a science that's not in finance that would be in I, I, I understand that but if yeah. it's we bought a lot of vehicles over the last few years a lot of vehicles which means there's a lot of vehicles that are going to be coming up for replacement at the same time in the future oh it, it, yes like with the 28 police vehicles sure. which, is, which is very concerning to me um, I sure, and then, yeah, it, it's I'm, also... It, I'm just wondering if we always have to buy new or if we could look for a really good used vehicle that might do the same job. We would have to consider maintenance in that case because yes. there's that offsetting cost. I understand that. Yeah, yeah. EJ? So, so currently the policy that council adopted many, many moons ago is we only buy, we do not lease, and it's only new equipment. Certainly that was policy direction for many years ago, so that could be changed if there's the will of council to do it. Um, but as of today, we have followed that policy direction. So we've never really seriously looked into it. Um, I can tell you it's really hard to find used trucks as well, so I'm not sure practically if that's an option, but if that's something council directs us to explore, we can certainly look into what the viability of that is, but it would be a uh, policy change by council to do that. Okay. My second question is on um, Brook, on your other list. It was a roof for Brook Lake. Yes, so that was, that was on the unfunded list. For Culture, I've talked with them over the years since we've owned that Brook Lake property, and they want it. They want to come and help us. So, has anyone talked to them about working with uh, with For Culture in King County to see if they'll replace a roof? I'm not familiar. I know that the that uh, the Parks Department is very vocal about that roof badly needing replacement. I know that they're very familiar with it. And so we know that it's a priority. We know that it's a must-do and it's overdue. And For Culture really wants to, to main, Good. make sure that that building 
stays here Good. in federal waste. So. And that would bring us the best value. Uh -huh. Yeah. All right. And then O-Court, O-Court, uh, I thought, so is this in addition to what we've already funded for O-Court, the, their system? I believe so, and I need to ask Thomas Fickner for that one, so I can ask him to be conversational about it when it comes for first hearing. Okay, and one more question, then I'm done. Great. On the Arts Commission, the $50,000 for that, I'd like to see a little bit more, but I'll, at this point, I'll, I'm happy for the 50000 Is that money that the Arts Commission will be deciding how to use, or is it already... Um, has staff already decided how it's going to be used? You know, that, that, that will go as an increase to the Parks Department budget, and that would, that would be a good question for John Hutton to answer. I don't, ha I okay. don't actually know that answer. All right. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Council Member President. Thank you, um, Chair. So the, remind me where the BPA crossing lights are, 20 Is that down by 21st Southwest? BPA, that's... Public Works. Yes. Yeah, oh, AJ said yes. Okay, and I, I pretty much know what engaged Fredway platform subscription is with IT for 25000 But uh, Remind me again what engaged Fredway is. I would have to ask Thomas. See, I see. Oh, do you happen to know? Yeah, yeah that's, we use that for our comprehensive plan update. Oh. Um, and I think we're kind of uh, expanding that because it, it found, found it to be very useful. Thank you. Good. Um, a couple questions. Um, one, a policy question that we may want to talk about sometime is, sure. you know, I travel all over the country. I work with fleets everywhere in the U.S. And many of the larger cities just roll their fleets over with leases and things like that, so they're always upgrading. I don't know if we've ever done a cost-benefit recently between buying a $75,000 cut truck and leasing it for seven years and it's getting a new been, one. It's been years since we looked we at might, that now. That's we, kind of to the deputy mayor's question. That would be a policy yeah. change, so we've stayed away from it. Well, we might want to look at it just because sure. $75,000 might actually fund two trucks for seven years and we throw them away and get two more. You know, it's it's a long-term budget issue. It's not it's yeah, the difference between a capital and not saying we should and I will tell you, leasing is much more expensive, but it does guarantee that that, that your it's, budgeting is smooth and your replacement is yeah, smooth. It's, it's uh, much it's much more expensive because you pay yeah. a tremendous more. What we however, your cash yeah. flow of the seventy five thousand may buy you more, so you can use it. It absolutely it absolutely will, and you'll get better condition because what we've done is we've extended the useful lives and gotten a lot more yeah. lives out of our vehicle, which is why we're. Anyways, and, and and so and we've prioritized other things in our budget okay. so to catch up with so be a if painful you could go, hit for me if you could go back to your very first page where you said uh, you showed the page of how much uh, not that one go back further uh, the numbers of what you're saving we got three hundred thirty thousand okay oh, right yeah here. sure so I have a hard time three hundred thirty thousand that's easy that's investment we know we got that. When you have something that says uncertain and we're going to spend it all, oh, I meant I, for the remaining nine months of the year. I don't, I don't think that we're going to okay, get but, favorable variances okay, but, necessarily. Okay, but to me, when I read these things, none of them to me are earth shattering that they mm -hmm. have to be done today. Some of them may be, but mm -hmm. 1.6 million because we have it, and you have uncertain, and you don't know what the first second quarter is going to look like. Why are we in such a rush to spend the money today? Is my it, is my it, answer is I'm trying to respond to the urgencies and the well, importance well, of, the waiting, uh, of the waiting list. If we've got the money and it's cash in the bank and I've got it, then I've got certainty for the first quarter. And I'm only willing to speak to that first quarter. Yeah, I know. You got the yeah. first quarter, but the second, yep. qu you know, the second mm -hmm. quarter, it's usually in, in when I do things in mm -hmm. my business, I have cash. I say I want to do this, but I make – and I don't just do it on – Yeah. You know, I'm still looking at that. So I just asked the question, if you got uncertain here, that's a red flag to me. So you're just not certain what, the if, remaining, gonna, if we're going to be flat even on the budget or have more. Right, right. 
it's a it, it was a positive first quarter and that could have been because we had a cold winter and the electricity utility tax was high I don't think that would continue during the rest of the year for and example. then with your certain invariance of 330 you know for the next three quarters you should have 900,000 up yeah. there yeah so I really so. what you're doing is you're saying we're gonna have 900 K on the top line so I'm willing to fill it in with the million three below mm-hmm it's, it's an art not a science but leveled right. it out right exactly right okay okay thank, thank you. you Erica do you have any questions yes I've had my hand up the whole time well you um, I you it doesn't show on the screen so I apologize for not getting okay to okay thanks there you go so I know I'm being really um, particular about something but one thing I found the city does is something costs you know forty eight thousand dollars if you go on uh, a Ford Super Duty um, 250, it starts at $48,000. And then we're going, we're budgeting $75,000 for something that starts at 50. It's confusing to me how um, you just automatically put on $28,000 on top of the, the starting price. Are our vehicles specially outfitted um is there is there something i'm missing here are you are you putting in some kind of some kind of uh radio that's going to cost thirty thousand dollars or how how does that work out that you're paying almost twice as much as when you just google it at the local car dealership Sure. So the F-150 we were talking about earlier was $48,000. It's, the F it's an F-250 is what I just looked up. Right. I just um, looked it up. Yeah. So I think our base price for an F-250 is about 50, 51000 by the time you get taxes and licensing. Um, the dealer price is actually less than than that. Um, but yeah. Why why are we to, budgeting 70? So here's my to, thing is we seem to pay a lot more money and budget a lot more money for things than they actually cost. And I'm just wondering why. So it, that is it, the actual cost. So when we get a truck for parks, which is this one specifically, um, yes, there is aftermarket outfitting. For this one specifically, it has a Tommy gate on the back of it. That's another $14,000, $15,000. It has all the emergency lighting, so it can be parked on the side of the road. So it gets corner strobes, it gets an overhead beacon, it gets the arrow board on the back of it. Um, by law, for the way we're using it, we have to put a headache rack on the back of it. It has to get toolboxes, and then it has to get the licensing that goes with changing it out from a standard citizen vehicle to an emergency vehicle. So when, okay. you, add, when you add all that up, that's where you're getting the 70 I don't have the number in front of me. I'll remember if it's 75 or 79. Steve has it. Yeah. Um, but that's where you get that total price is when you're adding everything else we have to do to the vehicle to be able to put it on the road. In addition, okay. And in addition, we're required to do three bids for most purchasing, except with vehicles, we, have, we can piggyback on state contracts so that we know that we are serving the city getting our absolute best low cost. Isn't that right, EJ? Yeah, so for all of these, and that's part of the reason we use Ford exclusively for anything under a 550, is we are, we're actually piggybacking on the State Department of Enterprise Services contract, and we're getting them anywhere from 15 to 25% below market value. Okay, thanks for that. I appreciate it. Any with other a, any with, other questions, Erica? No, and I need to pull this up to. All right. Do you want me to read the motion? Um, I don't see any other questions, so that'd be great. Yes, please. I move to forward the proposed or. This isn't an ordinance. I move to forward the proposed ordinance to a public hearing and first reading on May sixteenth, twenty twenty three. I'll second it. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you. We'll move it ahead. Great. That brings us to the uh, monthly financial report, and it's going to look a lot like uh, last month. No. Is that the one I hide? There we go. There. Uh, as of as of March, our, our first quarter, our revenues are. You know, the last last year we saw all of these were green, and this year we're in a new budget. We made some new estimates, and there are three of our revenues that are 
coming in a little bit lower than budget. So we're watching our business licenses, we're watching our real estate excise tax, and we're watching our lodging tax. Everything else is positive to budget. Uh, sales could, tax. Could you go back one? Yes, I sure can. So property tax, we estimated we were going to be down 62000 I guess. Oh, uh, property tax, our annual budget is $11.7 million. Okay. Uh, it's just a little early timing. in the year. Most of it comes in in April and again in October. Okay, got it. So okay. the timing is going to be kind of funny, but at the end of the year, I have a high degree of confidence we'll, yeah. we'll be there. Okay. Oh, you're right. That should be red. <laughs> well. my, uh, my formatting didn't, didn't work. Here's how the trend is looking for sales tax. We're just a touch over budget. Uh, we're quite a bit over, over prior year, but we budgeted a little bit more op optimistically this year. Our utility tax is quite a bit over budget, and it's also above prior year. So you can see consistently both of the first two months of the year, it came in nicely. Property tax, here's the graph that shows next month we'll get the first of the bulk of the semi-annual payments and then later in the year it comes in in October and November. So I'm not too worried about that one, but we're watching it, we monitor it. Here's the real estate excise tax and this is the one that, I mean, it, 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 it's only 50,000 under budget, it's only 86,000 less than prior year. However, this is the indicator of the real estate market. The property values have held up wonderfully. They went up 19%, but it's the pace of the transactions due to the mortgage interest rates. So this is going to impact the, uh, the, the pace that we're going to be able to do projects, possibly. We're watching it. So, uh, lodging you, tax, I think we budgeted can, can pretty... Go, can I ask you one other question? Please do. Let's go back to that one. Are, you, are we able to look at last year's sales of houses versus this year's and know how much the differential is? We are, but I think the bigger factor is the, the, the large property transactions. When an apartment building changes hands or something like that, there are some significant spikes. And we took those out for our budget. Okay. So we think we budgeted cautiously, but still, we're not hitting budget. Okay. Yes. So, and, and, and what it shows us is it's the pace of transactions. Uh, lodging tax, we budgeted, we, we were hopeful that, that we would be back to pre-COVID uh, uh, levels, even though we're down the number of hotel years because King County could, took a couple of our hotels. And so we're, we're monitoring this, but this is also the one where we're only spending uh, yeah. when, when we get uh, tourism enhancement grants, so. Yeah. Lodging tax is a, is a uh you know, a, a rounding error in our budget. I mean, we have to do it, but this is not going to make a lot of I'll, difference. One I'll do another. respect to the people in the tourism and the hospitality yeah, no. industry, because we want them to thrive. Uh, we do, but but you're right. It's The scale of this at the end of the year is still under 300,000. You're yeah. exactly right. And here, ha and here's the benefit of the rates having increased. Uh, our, our, uh, our investment revenue is going to probably be close to three million this year and we'll just I'll just keep bringing this to you every, every month can you go uh, back to that one one more time sure maybe? so our the the money that you've invested in higher interest rates are fixed a number of years yes so this is not going to continue to spike because you've locked it in at two or three or four and we're not buying a whole bunch of new ones I don't think right, right. Now. so won't that line kind of even out we're getting about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per month in interest every month. So Which, this should yeah. actually stay straight line, going straight up to three million. Okay, but that's but, <coughs> the, the, but the differential between what we got and what you locked it in for. Yeah, we're not getting any variable interest rates. Don't make a bit of difference because you already locked them in. You're, every month we get a maturity and we buy a new one. When you get a maturity, one. you'll see a bump, but yep. that's not going to be for another two years, right? I got a couple slides I'll show you. Okay. Uh, it's only three months into the year, so in total, revenues are up 8%, and expenditures are also favorable 5%. And we'll just keep watching this every year. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, every month. Uh, cash is very stable. Uh, I'm, this, this is just me being transparent and accountable every month, showing it to you. Here's what you were asking. We had one maturity uh, one one million matured in March, and it was earning 1.8. Okay. 
and we bought three that were earning in the neighborhood of five. So we're able to drop some lower yield maturities, one per month. And, and to be honest, we're not going out four years. We just kind of bought some short ones just because that's where the, the highest rate was. This is, what the, this is what the market is doing. This was as of March. Uh, the two-year Treasury uh, was at 4.3, and it kind of peaked. It's, it, we expect it to stay kind of mostly level, and then it'll start declining when the Fed starts lowering rates. They haven't told us when. We're just, the market thinks they're going to. We have let a, we, we still have a lot of liquidity in our state pool. We still have $40 million that we could get at the next day if we needed to, and we expect not to. When does our next one mature? Once a month. We get we get once a month. You're $1 million going to be reinvesting. Ma matures every month. A million dollars once a month going forward. So in yeah. So that way we've only subjected one million dollars of our whole portfolio to whatever the rates happen to be, whatever month it matures. Yep. So the <clears throat> so the state pool average is one point eight three. Uh, no, the state pool currently its average is about four and a half percent. They only buy. Uh, three-month uh, investments. So, so we're, we're, we're averaging about a percent more than yep. theirs. Yep. yep. So, so let me ask you the question. Interest rates right now are 4% or whatever they are, mm -hmm. and you're having a million dollars a month rolling over that you're mm -hmm. going to buy another million dollars. So you, you are actually raising the, the revenues. If you're going to have that many coming due over the next three months, are you thinking about, well, are the rates going, you think the rates are going to go down or you think they're going to go up? I mean, if you have a million coming off every month, wouldn't you want to maybe be a little bit more bullish and conservatively bullish so you can lock in the higher rate? We're That's buying, a, yeah. we, our, our strategy is to buy a four-year oh, maturity four. okay. once a month whatever the rates are of the day that we invest. And you know, is. on any given day, you know, we, we kind of look, which day of the month should we buy? Should we let it go up or down? And we just have to hold our nose if we don't like the rates, buy the best rate that day. Because over time, we've got a very smooth portfolio. Yeah, you've, done a, you've done a good job on that. It's, it, it, it's given us some budget, sir. It let, us, it let yeah. us fund the Arts Commission. Yep. That's as interesting as I can make it. Thank you for letting me share with you the finances of the city. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yes, Deputy Mayor Honda. The utility tax rebate uh, program closes the end of May. <clears throat> and I would like to see at the Senior um, Resource Fair next week, May 11th, at the PAC, if we could have information there so that we can really do a big push to get more people to um, apply for this. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. We can make materials available for that. Uh, We've, uh, we, we can print out the stuff that but anybody can print it out on the website, but we can print some out and set it up there. Okay. If you give it to Amy, she can get it over there for yep, us. Yep, we are happy to do that. It's a great program. It's, if you go to the city's website and you go to the finance department, it's uh, one of the menu items there. Anybody can look there, and I hope that anybody listening would check it out. Yeah, uh, we just need to get back to where we were before COVID. Right. So, but thank you very much, and I appreciate the work that I know Sherry's done a lot of work on it. And I appreciate that. Yep, thank um, you for being an advocate of the program. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Council uh, President. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Director Groom, this is a future question, not for you to answer now, but something that we need to consider. Since the state legislature did not um, do anything about the, the drugs are going to be legal now, and we're going to be passing an ordinance, I believe, that will uh, put it uh, using uh, possession of drugs in our city uh, as a gross mi dis mis misdemeanor, which should then put them through our courts. So will our courts be needing to be funded at a higher level because of increase? You told me I didn't have to answer that right now, but, but the city well, attorney and I were just talking about that today. <laughs> to be fair, I think the more likely expense is the prosecutor. Okay. So the police already prosecute, already or staffed to look into these sorts of crimes. Um, traditionally, or in the past, the prosecution was done by the county. So um, there is a chance that there would be some in impact to the courts, but I think the more immediate effect is going to be a prosecutor. Um, we're going to watch it. If this ends up being something that adds 
several hundred cases or three or four hundred cases a year. Uh, not, I shouldn't just say prosecutor, the attorneys, both prosecution and defense. It could be an impact on both of those. Okay, thank you. Um, Erica, do you have any questions? Okay. No. Okay, I, I, I have one more question. Uh, this has to do with the utility tax that the deputy mayor brought up. Um, I've asked, I asked Bill um, Ladino to do a kind of a search on how many seniors we have in Federal Way, and he's coming up with a number, and I don't know what that is. It's somewhere between 12 and 13,000. If we're, and I don't know what, how everybody qualifies for the utility tax, and I know there's probably a lot of people that don't know they qualify for a tax rebate for their property taxes, because I talked to one the other day that had no idea. It would seem to me that if we get that statistic and we're really concerned about people getting tax rebates, which I think is a good thing, we might want to mark it to that list when Bill gets it done and figure out who we can go out and say, did you know you could do this instead of just hoping they come to the May 11th fair and maybe be proactive if, I mean, Deputy Mayor Honda talks about this every time we have a meeting. And uh, instead of talking it up here, maybe we should proactively find who those people are that qualify, reach out to them, send them an email, send them a note and say, did you know you could save whatever it is on utility tax? And by the way, King County has a property tax rebate if you met this criteria. Right. And instead of, I mean, I appreciate we talk about it. I think it's great that the deputy mayor brings it up all the time, but why don't we be proactive and Well, let me tell you what we have do done. We have done a lot yeah. of those yeah. things. Do you know how many people qualify in federal way? I, well, and I don't even I just mean, because you're 65 or, or whatever doesn't I don't mean know what, you qualify. Well, I, I know. Yeah. I mean, you and I wouldn't qualify um, probably. Do we know, Sherry? Did we ever figure out how many people qualify? <laughs> well, it is based on um, uh, income. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really just the knowledge that you have. Yes. So well, it, like I say, it's it's it, it's all based on income. We know what and, and, and age and income, right? Not if it's not a senior, aging, that oh. We open it up. It's just income. Yeah, we, oh, we oh. open it up. Well, something we should talk about. If we're going to talk about getting this, we should proactively find the people and make sure they get it. Sure. We've, and, done, we've and, done a lot of work. And Deputy us. Mayor and Sherry have done a lot of work. Let me just tell you real quickly, uh, we've sent out letters to 100% of the past five-year participants. Uh, we've added the info and the materials to the city website. Uh, we presented uh, here at the November Fed Rec uh, that the application was opened and on the website. Uh, we gave it to Steve McNay to uh, put it on, this, on the, the, the city website. Sherry went to the January Senior Advisory Commission, and she posted flyers at Walmart. And in February, we had flyers at the State of the City tables, and I couldn't even tell you what else Deputy Mayor's done. We're trying. <laughs> we have the, we have I'm the not suggesting we're not trying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, no, no. I but just think I, proactively. We yeah. have the Senior Commission out there talking to people all the time. It, wherever they can find people right. telling them about it. Yeah. It's not that we're not trying, it's just- I, I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying we're not trying. I just, I just remember somebody said, hey, there's great statistics. You can dial it in with AI, you know, pinpoint the people <laughs> who get it. And maybe we should think about that sometime. Okay, Erica, nothing else that you have? Um, we're yeah. gonna, we're gonna adjourn. I thought we had to forward the... Oh, the sorry. Gee, I'm glad you're there. Do we good, have to... Motion. Did, did yeah, motion. you can make a motion. I was going to get us out of here without doing that and then cause all sorts Jack, of problems. I would normally take you up on it, but, you know. <laughs> thank, thank you for keeping me honest. I appreciate it. All right. I move to forward the March 23 monthly financial report to the May 2, 2023 <coughs> consent agenda for approval. I'll second that. All in favor, aye. Aye. Okay, now we can adjourn. Good night, Eric. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Caught up in the enthusiasm of the meeting, didn't you? Yeah, it's time to go home, right? <laughs>